right. Good evening and welcome to the Keneal Bay Area Redevelopment and Management Plan Civic Engagement Public Meeting with the community for Virgin Islands National Park. My name is Kelly Daigle and I'll be helping to facilitate and moderate today's presentation. Before turning things over to Superintendent Nigel Fields, I first want to thank you for joining us virtually. And I'd like to go over some logistics for the meeting just to make sure everyone is comfortable using the Microsoft Teams platform and everyone knows how to provide comments or ask questions at the end of the presentation. As an attendee, you will be in listen only mode just for the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we would like to hear from you and answer any questions you may have and gather your feedback. To do this, We'll start by calling on each community group and its representative, followed by other attendees on the line. And we have a slide at the end of the presentation with, with each of the community groups in attendance, so we'll follow that order. At the time that you're called, we're asking that you please raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. And I will go ahead and unmute you and call on you to speak verbally. So to find the raise your hand icon, if you look at the top of your Teams platform, you should see a smiley face icon with a hand. If you scroll over that, you'll see the hand icon and that's how you raise your hand. Just to make sure folks know where that is, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand now, that will let me know that kind of the majority of folks have this feature and are able to raise your hand. Great. I'm seeing quite a few hands come in. Excellent. And you can lower your hand uh, through that same way. So hover over that icon and then just lower your hand that way. So um, for those of you that have dialed in, I think we have a few that have. You can also raise your hand by hitting the star five. Um, and you can also unmute yourself by hitting star six. So star five to raise your hand, star six to unmute. At the end of the presentation, after you've had a chance to ask your questions or provide any comments, um, I will either lower your hand or you can lower your hand um, yourself and then we'll move on to the next participant. We welcome as many comments and questions from everyone. So if you'd like to ask an additional question, just go ahead and raise your hand again. Additionally, at any time during the presentation or during the question and answer session, you can type in um, any comments or questions into the chat box. Um, and that's that little icon here on the second black image uh, down from the bottom. Feel free to type there at any time. And once we get through all the verbal questions, we'll address any of the comments or questions that have come in via that chat box. Lastly, uh, you have three dots at the top of your Teams icon. Um, this allows you to change your device settings. So here's where you can, you know, toggle between different microphones, different cameras. Um, you can also turn on live captioning. Uh, we will also uh, do a closed caption of this presentation afterwards. So what we'll do is we'll address questions and comments after the presentation until just before 7.30 p.m. At that point, if we've not gotten to everyone, uh, we would welcome you to submit any additional questions or feedback via our Pepsi system, and Superintendent Fields will go over how to do that in the presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Superintendent Nigel Fields for our presentation, and I'll rejoin you for our question and answer session and touch back on a few of these items. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nigel Field, superintendent here at the park. I wanted to first start off by introducing several folks on our team that are joined us. We have an interdisciplinary team of experts. Some of them are from right here in the park. Some are from our regional office, our Washington office, and also our Denver Support Center. So I'll ask each of them to kindly turn on their camera for a second and say hello and introduce themselves. And we can start in the order that we have here on the slide, starting with Elsa. Good evening, this is Elsa Alviar from Virgin Islands National Park. This is Anna Tolene. I'm Acting Chief of Resources at Virgin Islands National Park. Hi, I am Linda York. I am the National Park Service Regional Coastal Geomorphologist 
and I am providing input as needed on any uh, coastal or shoreline concerns that come up. Good evening, I am Jamie Hammond. I'm the regional environmental coordinator for the region, just helping support with uh, the planning side of the project. Hi there, my name is Bill Hunter. I'm the regional historian for Interior Region 2, and I'm here to help develop the project through the National Historic Preservation Act process. Hi everyone, again, this is Kelly Daigle. Um, I'm the project manager for the NEPA, pre-NEPA planning and NEPA efforts. Yes, this is Bill Stevens, uh, Chief of Commercial Services for Interior Region 2. And good evening, everyone. My name is Gordy Keto. I'm the leasing program manager for the Washington Support Office here in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Weiser. I'm an environmental planner with Stantec Consulting Services. We're supporting the National Park Service with some of the technical studies. So I want to thank the team a, for being here on a, on a late day and certainly thank everyone here uh, joining us from St. John for part participating in this virtual session. I know that virtual sessions aren't always ideal. Our team has also had to learn how to make adjustments to having public meetings in a virtual setting, but safety is so important to us, not only here in the Virgin Islands, but everywhere. So we certainly wanted to make sure that our communities are safe and that we're also finding ways to make sure you're hearing about the information so that we can have effective engagement with the process. So thanks for your patience with us. Uh, and I think we're all having to be patient with each, each other as we all kind of cope with uh, the realities of COVID and keeping each other safe. So during our session today, we're going to review a little bit of the background on Keneal. As you know, the history of the site is directly relevant to our redevelopment plans and to our discussion today. I'm going to explain the purpose and need for the Park Service to outline a future for the Keneal Bay area. I'll share four preliminary alternatives for the future activities and the use of the site. The key environmental issues that may differentially affect the outcomes across the four alternatives will also be mentioned. And as organizations and as community leaders within the St. John community, you are encouraged to provide your comments uh, on the concepts that I'm going to share with you today. We're aiming to build them up and to improve them, and your input is going to help out with that. So later on in the presentation, I'll share exactly how you can provide your public comments toward the end of the presentation. And then Kelly is going to come back on to lead us through the moderated Q&A. So from what we understand, there have been transitional and permanent settlements on St. John for over 2,000 years. Tyano artifacts that are found on St. John and within the area of Keneal Bay reveal a thriving, sophisticated, and stable culture. The colonial period introduced permanent settlements of Africans and Europeans across the entire Caribbean, and Keneal Bay contains historic structures and archaeological features which speak to this tumultuous period. Keneal Bay is also a key site in the 1733 slave revolt, which sparked a series of subsequent protests against slavery in the New World. Lifeways on St. John continued to evolve during the post-colonial period, which introduced additional cultures leading to the American transfer in 1917. A focus on tourism eventually led to the idea of establishing a national park, and at the same time, Lawrence Rockefeller's interest in establishing a new model of ecotourism led him to purchase an existing modest resort in the 1950s, and he re-envisioned Keneal Bay as a resort that would focus on the natural and cultural features of the landscape. In 1983, Rockefeller donated Keneal Bay Resort to the National Park Service, and he did so using that special, unique, retained use of state, which we often refer to as the RUE. And the RUE allowed the resort to continue operating independently for 40 years until September 30th, 2023. This upcoming transition next year was anticipated over a decade ago, and a public law allowed the National Park Service to determine if a non-competitive long-term lease was the best option for seamless operations, resource protection, and for continuous benefit, economic benefit to St. John. At the time, the National Park Service began negotiating with the holder of the RUE and began evaluating the site. This included nominating historic structures and contributing features to the Keneal Bay Historic District, 
This period also included a basic site assessment just to identify if there were any environmental concerns. In 2013, there was an unfinished report recommending the transition of the RUE into a lease. However, more environmental investigation was needed, and between 2014 and 2016, there was more environmental sampling that was done, and, and it revealed that there were contaminants of concern, and those were described in a 2017 report. But then again, in 2017, Hurricanes Irma and Maria came through, causing severe damage to the Virgin Islands and also to Canal Bay Resort. The resort closed, and to date, the overnight accommodations have not resumed. This event changed the equation as the goal was now not only to establish a National Park Service commercial agreement of some sort, like a lease, but now we have to potentially rebuild the resort. So I've just summed up an awful lot of history, time, and circumstance in three slides, but I think what I'm conveying is clear. The people of St. John, the National Park Service, and Keneal Bay have a shared history, and with this in mind, we asked the public back in April and May of last year four key questions. We asked, what type of connection have you had with Keneal Bay? What are your thoughts on preserving the history and the culture of Keneal Bay and St. John? What have been the greatest challenges of Keneal Bay, past, current? And how can the National Park Service improve operations in, uh, of Keneal Bay in the 21st century? How do we move now into the 21st century? And we had tremendous responses, many of which came from St. Johnians and from Virgin Islanders. Here's what we heard. We heard that Keneal Bay must highlight the cultural significance of the area, including that archaic period through European colonialism, through the post-colonial period of emancipation. We heard of the importance of access for residents as well as for visitors to the site. We heard really touching stories of the deep affection that Keneal Bay employees had to Keneal Bay, long-term visitors, those that came back year after year. And we also heard about those relationships that were forged between employees and long-time visitors over decades. We heard about the importance of Keneal Bay contributing to the local economy. We also heard from you regarding values of community stewardship that you want to see, you know, a desire to make sure there are things like living wages that are offered and that there's a focus on hiring locals. And of course, rebuilding in sustainable and resilient ways using practices that are best practices for today, and also making sure we're protecting the natural and cultural resources. So let's now focus in on the site here on St. John. Um, as you know, uh, we're uh, wanting to focus in on the red box there to the left. We're also gonna speak a little bit on the maintenance area right downtown in Cruz Bay. That's gonna be relevant to two of the alternatives. And then on the right, you see the area of um, the resort itself. So I'm gonna read the purpose statement. Our purpose is to identify a sustainable and resilient redevelopment strategy for Keneal Bay, for the Keneal Bay area, that preserves and protects its significant cultural and natural resources while providing a range of visitor experiences, including overnight and day use opportunities, and promotes economic activities that integrate the values and history of the community of St. John. It's all one sentence, but it's a lot of words. So I think it's good for us to take another pass at this and to better understand what's within it. Our purpose is that we want to en envision the building in a way that is sustainable and resilient. We wanna make sure that we're putting in a good investment in the public's trust. We have learned so much since the Rockefeller era on how to be light on the land and how to design for safe water and energy systems that minimize those adverse impacts. We know much more about construction materials and practices which withstand the environment. Part of our mission in the Park Service is to protect the natural and those cultural resources that are within our care. It is a driving force of the work that we do every day. It's a part of our raison d'etre. Also engaging Visitors is a part of our mission. We want to engage visitors in those rich, meaningful experiences that help them to learn about the resources and hopefully to love them and to care for places that are special like Camille Bay. We're certainly aware of the economic development opportunities here, but we're aware also that economic activities like this must be offered equitably and must be done in balance with environmental protection. And whatever the outcome, the values and the specificity of St. John must shine through. There are many places in the Caribbean to visit, many resorts that one can see, but there's only one Keneal Bay, there's only one St. John, 
And Keneal's future must reflect that broad history, the breadth and the depth of the history and the people and the values of St. John. Currently, we have a need to address any of the impacts that have happened since the hurricanes on the site, looking at those natural and cultural resources. We have a need to make sure we're integrating Keneal Bay within the overall management of the park. And we also have a need to make sure that as soon as September 2023 is coming around, we have a way of assuring there's accessibility and it's a welcoming space for locals and for our visitors. Our objectives are to meet those needs, right? We want to establish that National Park Service experience. We want to provide for those economic opportunities and we want to preserve and protect the natural cultural resources, the marine life, and making sure that we're light on the land, blending in uh, the resort, any rebuilding that happens into the landscape and make sure that it fits into the overall footprint of the park. So we're going to now talk about these preliminary alternatives. There are four that we're going to discuss. There is a no action alternative and there's three action alternatives. So there's a no action, which essentially means non, no commercial activity, so non-commercial, no action. And there's three commercial activities that we could do, uh, alternative A, B, and C. So let's first talk about the no action, no commercial option here. So in this no action alternative, the National Park Service is not issuing a lease or a concessions contract. In this scenario, the park keeps the roads open, the trails clear for safe passage, so people can access the beaches. Historic structures are assessed. We'll see which ones are safe, which ones need to be stabilized. The park service would then develop a plan for how we're gonna deal with deferred maintenance. We monitor plants, animals, marine life, archeological sites, just as we do in other parts of the North Shore beaches. So even though there's no commercial action in this scenario, you can see there's nonetheless a lot of responsibility to maintain ecological balance to maintain the cultural history of those buildings there and also making sure that there's public safety. Before I go through each of those three commercial options, I'd just like to say that each of these three next options contain some basic features that are common to all. Uh, one, all of them contain um, um, greater access uh, to the public to, to the site. All of them focus on protecting cultural and natural resources. Whatever redevelopment would happen under these commercial options would be light on the land, be sensitive to, to the landscape and the geographic history of the space. And all of them would try to bring about that St. John focused experience, that, that sense of the history of the and the depth and breadth of, of the community here. So let's take a look at alternative A. This is our, our proposed action at this point. So you'll see on the map on the right, there are five colors on the study site, and we're going to go through each of these colored zones. Uh, let's first talk about the purple area on the map. The purple area is designated as the resort zone. So imagine a rebuilt Keneal Bay resort with a variety of overnight accommodations. There's recreational activities, spa services, outdoor event spaces, restaurants, vir virtually all the things that were part of the original footprint but without the need for the entire 150 acres. In this scenario, most of the features and functions of the resort and the things that people come to expect with Keneal Bay, that kind of one of a kind resort experience, most of those are maintained while also making room for some other opportunities. And that's gonna take us to the blue zoned area there. So let's look at the blue zone. So imagine a National Park Service style experience at Honeymoon Beach for day use. Imagine that you can take the trail from Lynn Point, connect those along Keneal Bay Beach, going out to the entrance, tying into the Tamarind Trail, the Keneal Hill Trail, also being able to go all the way over to Turtle Point. Day use at Honeymoon Beach could include water sports. It could include local vendors, local foods, local crafts, a snack shop and a comfort station. The commercial activities at Honeymoon Beach could operate under a concessions contract or a commercial use authorization. If it's under a concessions contract, that could be independent of the resort area, the purple zone there. Looking up at Hawks Nest Beach there, just under Total Point, the other blue area, at Hawks Nest, there's another potential opportunity for commercial activity here as well, which could include overnight accommodations, priced more in a mid-range area. So this pricing could form a niche between, say, Cinnamon Bay Campground and what could be the higher end um, price range uh, within the resort. 
So this day use area under Hawks Nest could also be open to the public, and that would essentially open up more of Hawks Nest Beach to the public all the way from the area that's proposed under there under under Turtle Point uh, along a potential uh, old road bed that we could map out and create a new road there going down the hill to the Hawks Nest Beach that we all know and treasure. So all of that then becomes more open public space if in this scenario. The green zone areas are undeveloped, and in this scenario, they will remain undeveloped, and so the trails uh, would be accessed if there's a road, it would be opened. This scenario also allows for um, new maintenance operation for the Park Service on this campus. So the opportunity here is for the Park Service to build its maintenance facility on the campus that has the buildings that the Park Service needs, as well as the buildings that would be needed by the resort. In the time course of how this is all worked out, uh, the National Park Service had already submitted a number of years ago a request to rebuild our maintenance facility. It's lived past its life stage. It's time for us to update that facility. Uh, and so we were looking at where that facility could be placed. It can be placed where it currently is now, or it can be moved, or parts of it can move to other places. So the timing aligns to where we could potentially rebuild uh, the maintenance facility, a portion of it in this location and have that shared campus and make sure there's efficiencies that we don't need to have two maintenance yards that are less than two miles from one another. So there could be some real benefit to looking and exploring this option. It also allows for the existing maintenance yard to potentially be turned into a transportation hub. I was just uh, seeing uh, Governor Bryan's tweet that he posted while he was in Washington, D.C., and he spoke about the future of electrification in the Virgin Islands and mentioned that the energy future of the VI is going to be focused on, on electric. And Alternative A really directly aligns with the governor's interest in supporting more electrification. If we have this transportation zone right downtown in Cruz Bay, it allows for us to have a designated space for parking, for electrifying vehicles, for also having uh, smart parking features where using Wi-Fi or 5G technology, People can reserve spaces, uh, be able to have their um, payments all made, all within one space, all using um, technology, uh, and also being able to have a space for taxis to turn around. And if we need rental car spaces, all these things can be done by design right downtown uh, Cruz Bay, relieving some of the parking congestion that we have and also reducing the need for us to create a lot of parking out at Camille Bay. Alternative A also includes what we call the interpretation and engagement zone. This allows for the National Park Service to interpret many of those historic features that are, quite, are present on the site, the, uh, the mill and some of the other features from the colonial period and also from the post-colonial period that are still present. This could allow for the National Park Service to have uh, a contact station um, and also for us to work with a partner organization to build, construct, design, and maintain a community space. One of the things that we heard during our open call for comments back in April and May, there was a, some interest that people had in having some form of public space, be it a community center, uh, a museum, or an amphitheater. And this scenario allows us to work with an outside entity entity to uh, look at how we may be able to provide that service here. So alternative A has a number of things going on. It maintains the original tradition and the location of most of the features of the pre-hurricane resort. It provides for concessions opportunities at Honeymoon Beach and Hawks Nest Beach just under Turtle, under Turtle Point. It includes that shared maintenance facility and also the downtown transportation hub. It protects those green spaces from any future development. And it also has an interpretation element and the possibility of working with an outside partner for a community facility. Alternative B is fairly similar to Alternative A, the difference being that Hawks Nest Beach now is a part of that original footprint of the resort, and the responsibilities and the access there would now be managed by, by any potential lessee to the resort zone. We've also, in this scenario, removed that National Park Service contact, and the protection of those resources and interpreting those resources would be a part of the responsibility of any lessee in this, in this scenario. We do maintain, though, the 
uh, Hawks, the, the Honeymoon Beach area as a potential concessions contract or other public access area there. And we also maintain that shared maintenance facility that uh, that maintenance campus which could also allow for that transportation zone right downtown cruise bay and this also allows for that community space for us to work with an outside partner to still have a space for either an amphitheater a museum or a community uh, community space alternative c keeps the resort in its current footprint and all of the commercial activity is given to one potential lessee or one potential commercial entity. So uh, all the responsibilities then for access, for interpretation, for protecting those sites, all those things then fall under the contract for that one lessee. Uh, it makes it where it's just one entity that we're working with, but then there's all the responsibility we're conveying to that one. In this scenario, the maintenance facility um, would just be only for the resort. We would not have that shared facility there. We would not in this scenario have that community space available and there wouldn't be a significant National Park Service presence here. So as you can begin to imagine, there's quite some differences between these four options and the factors that we're interested in um, um, that help us better understand these distinctions between them and also gives a sense of the consequences are listed here on the slide. For those that are on the phone, um, we have visitor use and experience because we think that each of these options give a different type of visitor use and experience. Certainly the cultural resources and the archeology span are going to be differentially affected by the type of development that we have on the site. How we look at those historic buildings, which have historic character, which also have maintains their integrity, which ones we can keep and where they can be, um, may have some differences across these options. Looking at the marine resources, the cultural resources, the stabilization of those beaches, what type of activity may um, need to be mitigated based upon the level of development there. Being very careful about the floodplains, we certainly want to be mindful of storms in existing flood areas and where we need to be careful about rebuilding and what things we can mitigate, do to mitigate any potential flood hazards there. So these are some of the environmental concerns that we're focusing on now. And we also feel that many of the members of the St. John community organizations have a lot of information that you can also share and offer comments on for many of these features, especially things like the visitor use uh, and, and experience. We really wanna make sure we're thinking very broadly about the potential use of the site. So here's what we are today. We're discussing these conceptual, this conceptual range of alternatives. We are driving towards a decision though towards the end of this year. So by December of this year, we aim to know whether there will be action or no action, whether we're gonna have a commercial oppor opportunity and not if we're gonna just let the beaches be open and not do any commercial development. If we're going to go with an action alternative, we're going to have commercial activity. Our goal is to know what type of commercial activity we're aiming to have based upon the feedback we receive and also begin working toward offering those com uh, those competitive uh, commercial opportunities. So that would uh, kick us off in the very beginning of next year, 2023, looking at how we can offer those for under request for proposals or prospectus. Uh, our goal is to uh, have a decision on who would be the selectee as we move into the middle of 2023 uh, so that we can begin the design period, designing a phase as soon as possible, uh, moving into uh, closing out the design and having all the reviews by 2024 so that we can begin construction in that 2024 all the way through 2025, probably phasing in opening the resort in 2026. So that's kind of a higher level um, our expectations of the, of the timeline at this point. But our most immediate uh, interest is to get public comments on these alternatives, this sort of conceptual range that we've, we've described today. Uh, we have the public period open now. Uh, we aim to close the public comment period on February 17th. So we really wanna make sure people can get in their comments by the 17th. In the meantime, we're wrapping up that environmental investigation that we began a few years ago. And then as you may recall, we went and did some uh, sampling in the very beginning of last year. Uh, and then we just finished up a sec second round of sampling to make sure we captured everything that we could. Uh, we aim to get the results of that second round of sampling uh, to the public between April and May 
of this year, and we want to get the report out in the summer. Our goal is around September is to have that action memorandum that outlines um, the contamination, the locations, and the cost of cleanup and our plan for cleaning up all by, by the beginning of the fall of this year. So we can really wrap up that, um, that environmental investigation. Meanwhile, our goal is to begin wrapping up this environmental assessment process as well, the one that we're undergoing here to look at these options and to get to an action, no action. We aim to wrap that up beginning in the fall, get one more round of public comment, and then have a decision on whether we're going to be action or no action by September, by December of 2022. So we have an ambitious year, but we know that we can accomplish it, and you are very much a part of the process for us doing so. The types of comments that would be really helpful. So as you're beginning thinking about uh, the things you'd like to contribute is about that purpose that I read through and the, and the, the clarity of it. Does it capture uh, the things that are really key for us? Do our needs and our objectives, do they resonate? Um, the feedback that you can provide on those conceptual range of alternatives, what's there, what's missing? And importantly, what types of activities uh, should happen at Camille Bay going forward? And are there data points that we need to be aware of? Is there other additional information that we need to analyze to make sure we're really evaluating the consequences? Our goal is to get to the best option by evaluating these consequences so that we can be mindful of the impacts of any future activity on the site. How to comment. So you can make your comments known to us by going to parkplanning.mps.gov slash Keneal Bay Redevelopment. That website uh, has most of the materials, all the materials that we've been providing are there. So they're a great reference point for um, this presentation, which is already uploaded. The newsletter is there. So a lot of reference materials are very helpful there, but that's also where you can provide your comments. You can also mail your comments or hand deliver them here to our park headquarters location. Um, that's to Keneal Bay Redevelopment slash Management Plan. Address it to the superintendent, 1300 Cruise Bay Creek, St. John VI 00830. Once again, your comments must be received by, by February 17th. When you go to the website, you'll see that uh, there's a click. You can click on the space for open for public comment. After you do that, it's going to open up the space for the newsletter. You click on that and you'll see the box that pops up to say comment now. And that, once you click on that, opens up the space where you can put in your name, your email address, and write your comments. So there's just a couple of clicks to get there from opening up the site to clicking on the comment to opening up the get to the comment now box and then click on the space where you can actually enter your comment. So um, that's exactly what it looks like. So hopefully there won't be any difficulty that you have with that. So I think that wraps up the presentation here. And once again, I want to thank you and thank our community organ organizations for helping us to reach as many people as we could. We also know there's another public meeting that we're aiming to have on Tuesday. It's another opportunity. It's the exact same presentation, but it's another opportunity for us to reach an even broader group of people that's likely to be more of a national level call. But anyone, of course, is welcome to participate. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly so that she can moderate our Q&A session.